Many children have vivid imaginations and love to make up stories that are nothing more than strange and weird fantasies from a child's innocent mind. But what if the stories they tell are too real and too factual and what they describe could not possibly have come from the mind of a child as young as two or four years old? And you have to ask the question, where on earth could they have learned this as they could not read or write and the only TV or films they have probably viewed were cartoons or innocent children's shows. These special children were able to recall events, places, times and people's names with incredible accuracy. But how could all of this information come from someone so young and innocent? The following are five amazing stories from children who have got more than just a vivid imagination. Number 5. Luke Ruhlman Luke was a young boy from Cincinnati where his parents observed his strange behaviour as a two-year-old where he was extra fussy about safety around the home, concerned when crossing the road, drinks that were too hot or cold, generally things that a normal two-year-old would not normally be worried about. Then he became fixated on the name Pam and made comments saying, I used to have hair like that or I had earrings like that. Finally his parents questioned him asking where are you getting these strange ideas from and, and who is Pam? And his reply totally shocked his parents. He said I was Pam but I died and went to heaven and then I came back down again as a little boy. Then and asked him how did you die and he said in a fire and that he lived in Chicago and walked a lot and caught trains. His mother then wanted to know more about Pam and Luke said, I was a black woman of course. She then googled fires in Chicago and a major fire came up in a hotel called the Paxton which was in a predominantly black neighbourhood. His mother checked the names of the casualties and there she found that a 30 year old black woman called Pam Robinson had been caught in a hotel fire in 1993 and had plunged to her death. His parents decided to put their son to the test where they were able to obtain a photo of Pam Robinson and mixed it in amongst other photos. Luke immediately picked out the photo of Pam Robinson, the black woman he claimed he had previously lived his life as. Number 4 Cameron McCauley Cameron was a young Scottish boy from Glasgow who believed he'd lived a previous life on a small island called Barra, a remote island on the Outer Hebrides of Western Scotland. He would tell his mother that he'd lived as a young boy in Barra and then suddenly fell through to her in this life. From the age of two, he would tell his mother the same story and as he got older, the stories would become more detailed. His mother was confused as to how he would know of such a remote place that was over 200 miles from Glasgow and would take an hour to fly to by plane. The young boy was so convinced of who he was that his mother and well-known American child psychiatrist Jim Tucker from the University of Virginia took Cameron to the island to find further proof. Cameron had described a white single-story house that he lived in and that was located on the shore where a gate would open onto the beach and at the bottom were rock pools. He'd lived in the house with other children and a black and white dog that planes would land on the beach. He said his father's name was Shane Robertson who was killed when he was knocked down by a car. On occasions he said he missed his Barra family and previous mother so much that he became distressed. When they arrived on Barra Island Cameron immediately felt he'd come home and they set off to look for the white house he'd claimed to have lived in. As they were driving Cameron pointed out certain landmarks and was familiar with the surroundings. With his descriptions of the White House and the planes landing on the beach, local residents said he was describing an area to the north of the island. Initially when they started looking, all of their trails appeared to run cold until the following morning they received a phone call from the local heritage centre claiming they'd located a White House in the northern part of the island associated 
with the name Robertson. They said that the Robertson's family did not live on the island but regularly rented in the 60s and 70s. When they finally arrived at the house, the normally chatty Cameron had become subdued and the reality of his past life was now in front of him. And on further inspection, found it was a single-story White House located on the shore with a gate that opened onto the beach and on the beach were rock pools. Everything that Cameron had described and the other amazing fact was planes did land on the beach. Number 3. Carl Eden Carl was born in Millsborough, England in 1972 and at a very young age he claimed to have memories of being a German World War II fighter pilot and loved to play music by the German composer Johann Strauss. From a very early age his parents claimed he was not only very different from his two brothers in personality and being a difficult child but he looked totally different from anyone in the family where they were all dark haired and Carl was a strawberry blonde with blue eyes. Of course there was nothing unusual about that you might think as some members of a family can take out the grandparents or maybe cousins. But it was what he said as a young child that confused his parents by claiming at age three that he'd lived another life as a fighter pilot and he was killed when his plane crashed during a bombing mission over England. Carl even described his previous mother who he claimed was plump and had her hair drawn back into a bun. Before the age of five he was drawing pictures of the instrument panel in a cockpit and would also describe which part to push in order to release the bombs. Carl claimed he flew a Messerschmitt 110 so his father did some research on German planes to hopefully prove his son wrong. Initially his father believed he'd caught his son out when he told Carl that he'd found no record of that type of German plane but he decided to go to the library for a more thorough check and found that the plane his son claimed he flew in, a Messerschmitt 110, did indeed exist. What confused his family was that his parents never looked at war films and never had any books at home on war. So where did he get all of his information from about World War II or German warplanes? On one rare occasion when the family did look at a film, Carl was able to pick out the factual errors, especially where the badges were supposed to be located on the uniform. He described a German officer who reminded him of his superior and that his badge was on the wrong side of the uniform and when they later checked, they found what Carl had said was true. On another shocking occasion, Carl described how he actually died, that he was flying at low altitude and had lost consciousness and came to just before crashing into a building, losing a leg and bleeding to death. As children, Carl had told his brother that he would not live a very long life and would bleed to death at a young age. In 1995, at the age of only 23, Carl was stabbed by a co-worker and bled to death. To make this story even stranger, a couple of kilometres from where Carl was stabbed to death, excavators had recovered the remains of a German bomber plane and the remains of the crew. The pilot's name was Heinrich Richter who had died at the same age as Carl Eden. Near the dead pilot they found a ring with the letter P. Carl claimed as a German pilot he had a brother and his brother's name was Peter. Heinrich Richter's remains were buried in the same cemetery as Carl Ebdom where Carl's parents attended the funeral and they felt they had buried two sons but also felt both men had been finally put to rest. Number 2 Nicola Pert Nicola was born in Keighley in West Yorkshire UK in the late 1970s. In 1983 she was bought a toy dog which she would call Muff. The name of her dog Nicola claimed she'd also call when she was last alive as a boy. Her parents were confused and asked what on earth she was talking about and Nicola described her life when Mrs Benson was a mummy and that they lived in an old stone house at Haworth, a village in West Yorkshire and her father's name was Thomas Benson and she had two sisters. She said that her father had worked on the railways and was always coming home dirty 
she, or rather the boy she was remembering, had been killed when he strayed onto the railway line and got his foot stuck in between the tracks and was struck by a steam train. Her family thought this was just her imagination, as steam trains still pass by on a daily basis. Her parents felt that Nicola had obviously observed the trains and imagined everything. Moreover, the movie The Railway Children had been filmed on that line, which was set around the Victorian era that Nicola seemed to be remembering. And in the film, a young boy was trying to prevent a train accident by standing on the line. So it makes sense that Nicola had seen the film and as a very young child, the film had somehow become part of a real memory. The family decided to visit Haworth and on arriving had no idea where they were, as they had never been there before. However, Nicola led them straight to an old stone house that she said was her last home. The parents decided to go through the church records, which revealed that a family called Benson had indeed lived in Haworth and that the father was a railway man and they had a son born in 1875. Further research showed that the Benson family did live in the exact stone house that Nicola had taken them to. And in the census year of 1881, the record showed a mother, father and two daughters, but no son, because he'd been killed on the railway line as a young boy before the age of six, exactly as Nicola had described. Number 1. Ryan Hammonds Ryan was a 10-year-old boy from Muscogee County, Oklahoma. And when he was only four years old, he began having nightmares about things he couldn't explain. I went to his mother claiming that he remembers being alive many years ago in Hollywood, where he was a dancer and actor. Ryan's mother, Cindy Hammond, said that her son's stories were so detailed and extensive, a child his age could not possibly have made them up. And one of the claims the son made was of having lavish vacations and having five different wives and gave details about his past life, talking about going home to Hollywood and meeting actress Rita Hayworth. Ryan was talking about the golden age of Hollywood during the 1930s and 40s. His mother started looking through a book about Hollywood and was stunned when Ryan pointed to a man in a photo and said that it was him in his past life but he could not recall his name. The photograph was a still from the movie Night After Night. He pointed to another man in the picture saying, that's George, referring to George Raft, who was a famous actor in the 1930s and 40s. Ryan knew the entire plot to the movie in the picture, 1932's Night After Night, where Ryan insisted he was the man in the photo. His parents then watched the movie, but were disappointed to find that the man in the photo's name did not appear in the end credits, and later found that the role had no speaking parts. Ryan's nightmares continued, making his parents desperate to find help for closure. Eventually, they reached out to Dr. Jim Tucker, medical director of the Child and Family Psychiatry Clinic and associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. Dr. Tucker then approached professional film footage researcher Kate Coe to search for the man in the picture. After searching through endless pieces of information about the movie Night After Night, Co came across Marty Martin, identifying him as the man that Ryan had claimed to be. But it wasn't just one or two claims that Ryan had gotten right about his former life, but had accurately described about 55 different accuracies about the man in the photo. Initial records showed that Marty was born in Philadelphia in 1905. Ryan was right about being a dancer in New York and had danced on Broadway. Marty then moved to Los Angeles where he began as a movie extra as well as a dance director and then became a Hollywood agent where he set up the Marty Martin Agency. After learning of the identity of the man, the family traveled out to Hollywood to meet Martin's daughter, who was now an elderly woman, where Ryan was able to provide a lot of accurate information about his previous life as Martin. However, where Ryan insisted that he had two sisters, Martin's daughter claimed that he only had one sister. And when Dr. Tucker decided to look further into the claim, he found that Martin did indeed have two sisters and that his own daughter had just never knew about the other sister. 
On one occasion, Ryan said to Dr. Tucker, Why would God let me live to be 61 and then make me come back as a baby? It appears that Ryan had got his date of death wrong as Martin's records showed that he had died of 59, not 61, in 1964. Dr. Tucker looked further into Ryan's claims and found an old census record that claimed that Martin had actually been born in 1903 though his birth certificate claimed that he'd been born in 1905. The old census made Ryan Hannon's statement correct. Most of what Ryan had said was true when Marty was a big sunbather and taking girlfriends to the ocean. And there are pictures of Marty with girls on the beach and watching surfers, which Ryan also claimed. Marty was also married four times, exactly what Ryan had claimed. Marty became quite wealthy, where he and his last wife enjoyed a rich lifestyle. Ryan claimed he owned luxury cars, and records showed Marty owned a custom-made Rolls-Royce. Ryan also said he owned a piano, and Marty had many pianos in his house. The family lived in a mansion with a large swimming pool, as Ryan had described. Ryan said his address had rock in the name. Marty Martin's last house was located at 825 North, Roxbury.